And I just told them that you'd be talking about your journey because I think people are very interested in how an ordinary human being comes to where you are. So um, if you could just tell us something about that and then I'm sure people have questions. And you talked about wanting to speak about how you, embodying it is so significant. I think that's another, um, another thing we wanna get into, but really anywhere you wanna go with it, Kristen. I think the first thing I'll just say is that it seems to me we're in a just incredible, incredible time in, uh, in terms of the trajectory of, of human evolution. And that, um, I mean, it's what's totally exciting to me is that we're just alive at such a profoundly amazing time where awakening is, is possible for, for many. So there's a large there's a large movement that's happening, um, and that just like the 99th monkey, the more whenever we hit that, um, I mean I feel like we actually already have hit that point where enough people are awake and remembering that it's it's creating momentum for other people, it's cr you know creating momentum for others, and in my experience, it's not just people that are waking up, it's, it's animals that are waking up. Like I, I'm having a, a different experience with animals um, the last you know, number of years. So I don't think it's just relative to us humans. <laughs> but, um, and the reason I'm, I'm kind of prefacing it that way is to offer that inspiration for this possibility and if you're on fire on the inside it's because it's in your trajectory um and whether it's this lifetime or the next one or tomorrow or a month um doesn't matter so much right if you're in that movement then that's that's the movement that's happening that you're in so um we we don't have control over when that happens and there's a perfection in the timing of it so for me the unfolding was just it was just in the perfection of the timing for that to happen and um yeah and my my perhaps being on the cusp of this larger integration is just paving the way in consciousness for for humanity to to awaken and and open to what's possible and i also feel that that is true for these cities or extra sensory um uh you know perception you know that's or i don't know if that's quite the right word a capacity this extra extra sensory capacity also to me feels like it's just it's just our natural capacity it's our our natural human design to function in this way so um but again it's not about trying to make anything happen or seeing something on the outside that uh you try to make your own it's just that what's on the outside that you recognize as yourself, how do I say that? The inside and the outside are the same. I mean, it's one, it's one dynamic play in consciousness. There are a zillion things that you see each day, but your mind doesn't really register all of them in a way that engages you. When you start needing to buy a new car, a used car, you start noticing cars. Or if you're looking to buy a used red car, you suddenly see all the red cars on the road where the week prior, you didn't even notice a red car. So it's when the, the, it's the reflection of the outer and the inner, like mirroring each other where attention wants to go. And so if you are, if you're seeing awakeness or if you're seeing, um, you know, certain, uh, advanced skill sets, seemingly advanced skill sets that keep coming into your field, it's you as the universe reflecting that back to yourself for paying attention. So um, 
and I say that without, and, and from that place, there's no attachment or grasping or identifying with. It's just the reflective nature of the universe talking to itself, coaxing itself along in the direction that it wants to go. And so if you're interested in awakening, that's just what's happening. It's you as the universe just coaxing yourself in the direction that's inevitable, that, that you're, you're going. Um, so many people can be wondering what's wrong with them. Why aren't they awake yet? Or, or why, you know, there's like a, a self judgment thing that can happen. And, um, I'm not, I'm not wanting to, uh, uh, fuel that, <laughs> that, um, you know, self judgment that can sometimes happen in the, in the seeking. So in terms of my, um, my experience, I didn't even know about awakening. I hadn't even, I hadn't heard that word used. And um, although interestingly enough, it was the word I used, <laughs> I just started telling my friends some, some sort of awakening had happened, you know? Um, and it, it wasn't a, you know, Eckhart Tolle, you know, completely, mind-blowing experience that I had to go sit on a park bench and integrate for two years. Um, it was a, it was a shift that I recognized, um, but it was subtler. And then for me, there's been incremental shifts that haven't stopped. They just, they just kind of keep going. Um, but, but there were, there were, there were some significant things that all came together for that to happen. And um, one of them was that I had been feeling like there was a different kind of healing work that wanted to happen. I was in a, you know, had a massage, a shiatsu massage, Chinese medicine practice for a number of years and was, had been supporting myself financially through that for, you know, my adult life um, for a number of years. And because that impulse was there, I started studying in other places. So I, I studied with um, some Mayan, a uh, beautiful, beautiful Mayan healer, uh, an African shaman, and a uh, woman in California who had come up with her own healing system. And um, what happened, all, all of them were beautiful. But there was a recognition that that wasn't, it, it wasn't how it was going to happen. So with the Mayan healer, um, one of the techniques that was being used, and it's the, the training was extensive. I only just, just did a little scratch <laughs> on the surface. So I don't in any way want my sharing to somehow put down the brilliance of, of this work. Um, so it was just this, this moment of what the universe offered me to redirect me. So we were um, using eggs around joints to take toxins and imbalances out of the joints and put them in the eggs and then toss the eggs into the, the river. And um, there's so much brilliance in this <laughs> anyway, right, the recognition of the impact of the joints or how the joints can hold, um, hold imbalance patterns, the brilliance of an egg, the, the wisdom of that shape. Um, I mean, there's, there, you could talk about this stuff for, for hours. Um, and, you know, and then things going into the river, back into the earth and the flow and the, the healing of the waters. I mean, there's so much that was brilliant there. And my experience was waving these eggs around joints and then seeing these guides showing up, taking stuff out of people's joints and putting it in the eggs. <laughs> and, and part of my, you know, so I'm asking about, well, what about these folks, you know? And um, so it was just, and the other answers weren't, the weren't, weren't there. So it was clear to me, it just felt secondary, 
it felt secondary to be using eggs if I was seeing these guides, you know, engaging in this way. And a similar thing happened in the, the sh um, African shaman program, which was also stunning. Um, and we were supposed to be doing cowrie shells, throwing the cowrie shells for divination. And I got an answer that didn't resonate with me on the inside. And so I looked up to see which guides were tossing the shells. And, and I, I said to this guide, you know, inside on my mind, in, in the insides, I was like, that doesn't, that doesn't resonate, you know? And the being there said something like, I don't care, do what I say, you know? And so for me then there wasn't quality control <laughs> in the divination class for which beings were showing up. Um, so again, it was another like, okay, this isn't my path. This isn't, this isn't working. And then the last um, course, I mean, I don't know if you want all these, with all these details, but they do, they do lead to that place of trusting, trusting the truth on the inside that's guiding us in the midst of all these things on the outside, seeming outside. And so this woman in California had a gorgeous, brilliant practice. Um, and she used a, a, a co-practitioner, someone else's arm, like muscle testing yes or no questions for all these details of the body. And it was, again, this sense of I'll go bonkers if I have to ask yes or no questions. I just need to be able to see. I just need to be able to see. And so after going these routes, um, there was a com coming back home. And being with the arising point of the inner impetus where the sense of a different kind of healing work wanted to happen. So that had come from the depths and came out into my awareness. And I could feel it in through my system. And so I just followed that track back to where it came from and tossed back in through where I couldn't see to that, what I called source or spirit, where this came from, I tossed back in the full volition of, I can't do this. I can't find it. You, you, the divine, you, the deep truth within are going to have to do this. I've studied these things. I've, put a few years into this, put in a bunch of money, put in a bunch of time. It's not happening. None of these things are going to work. They're all brilliant practitioners. You're going to have to do it. So there was a profound just surrendering back into something that felt like my life purpose and a deep calling. So there was a surrendering of that saying, I tried. I tried. I can't do it. So that was one piece. But that piece demonstrates the path, the path to follow, which is back where things arise from. And let me be quiet for a moment. It's interesting to me as I share this with you because I can feel as I, you know, reflect back on this this experience and I'm using my I'm using my heart right there are different awakenings that happen through the mind but this component was in through the heart it was a there was a deep love I had a healing practice that I loved that I was completely committed to completely committed to serving others it was a surrendering of all of that it was a surrendering of purpose and uh, uh, service, productivity, um, right? It was a surrendering all that in through the heart where this, this desire arose from, this divine guidance desire arose from. So that was one part. Um, uh, <laughs> to be quiet for a second. <laughs>
we can sometimes get in the habit of sharing a story in the same way that we've shared it before. And um, that's not what wants to happen in this moment. So I'm resting in the infinite emptiness. So now I'm going to speak and keep my eyes closed because I'm speaking without memory. And this is not mind functioning. I'm speaking from the heart without thought. So the next component was related to the mind. And there was a... Um, a recognition of a, uh, an emotional patterning that I was living from, but hadn't been aware that I was living from. And so this awareness of this pattern revealed itself with an insight. The insight was that I had been living with a sense of trust, a deep trust of the universe or spirit or source. And there was a recognition of a hypocrisy that was present. Because although I listened and for the most part responded in kind with the inner directive coming from this larger truth, there was a large body of emotional fear and misunderstanding about the nature of reality that was influencing my actions and how I led my life. And so in this realization, because there was such a deep commitment to truth, there was disturbance that of a discovery of, of hypocrisy. And so my relationship to spirit at that time was um, this divine voice or impulse in the back of my head that was quiet but seemed trustworthy and would, would then, in a similar way to the desire showing up in the heart, there was a, I couldn't see where it came from, but I could feel the doorway, the entry point in which it entered my consciousness and then opened up through to then deliver the wisdom or guidance or insight. And I realized that was in the back and then I, the sense of Kristen, was in the front making decisions. And that the, the hypocritical part was if I was making decisions whether to do something or not do something that wasn't actually really trusting. <laughs> Even though I mostly followed through, it, was, it wasn't actually trusting, right? It was like, okay. What do I think about? Is that going to work? How, do, how, do, how does the outside world work in relation to this, this um, impulse? So the next step for me was um, making a decision. And so this was the use of will. And the, um, I recognized I had known, I don't remember how old I was, my early, early 30s. Um, I hadn't um, recognized, let me be quiet for a moment.
just a lot of energy moving through that's also being shared with all of you in the, the healing field right now. So I realized I had lived my entire life up to that point relating to source in that way. And that I didn't know what life would offer if I let that, that voice in the back, in the back seat, move to the front seat. I didn't know. And so it was an experiment total inner experiment and using the will that that engagement that commitment that commitment to um to real truth and integrity i set my whole fear set aside the fears were three i was afraid if i did that i was afraid that um uh, I would lose control of my life, my life would completely change, and that I would be bad. And in my uh, experiment, there is this willingness, like, okay, if I really trust that with my life, then all fears are erroneous, all fears have to be set aside to have this experiment actually, actually be real, actually have the have what it needed to be a real experiment. So I set those fears aside and um, and the beauty of it is all of the fears were all the fears were true. All of the fears reflected something that was true. There was just a complete misunderstanding of of how they were true. So, um, so as I'm sharing this, I'm, I'm realizing in this exchange that there were three components that had surrendered. My heart had surrendered my purpose. It had surrendered not knowing how to have purpose manifest, even though it was the one of the most precious things in my life. The mind surrendered. It recognized that it was living something that was not true. And it, it, may, it created in its own storyline an experiment that um, that created the, the infiniteness. After I, after I set those emotions aside and set the experiment, I let it go. I didn't do anything. Like when you put bread in the oven or brownies in the oven or whatever, I didn't keep opening the oven and poking it, <laughs> letting that hot air out and like testing it. There was a, a setting, setting the experiment and just letting it go. And so the mind then had surrendered and left itself open in complete unknown. When you set an experiment, you, you, you don't know the answer. You don't know the answer and you wait and see. And so the heart had surrendered, the mind, the purpose had surrendered, the mind had surrendered, and the emotional body, although it hadn't resolved all its issues, was willing to set them aside trusting that they would be resolved somehow. So those are the components that all came together. And then, and then what did I do? Nothing. <laughs> those were, that was the convergence. And I, and I think it was like two or three months later that I started saying, oh my gosh, some sort of awakening happened. And I was telling my friends and, 
you know, my healing practice started to change. And, um, you know, so that, that was the, that was the beginning. I'll also add that because the shift happened in my healing practice, um, let me share a little bit more backstory in that. So I started offering these other kinds of healing sessions. The, just briefly, the, the first person where this happened uh, was coming for severe sciatic, sciatic pain, had pain at different points in his back. And, um, and I sat down to read his pulses. I would read the Chinese medicine, the abdominal pulses, do a structural analysis. And then I would sit and um, I had believed up until that moment that I then used my education to come up with the treatment plan in that session for what, what techniques wanted to be used to support the rebalancing of the system. And so I did my whole check and then I sat there and normally a pl the plan would, would, I would just know what I was doing. And in that moment, there was a recognition that I never once, never once came up with a plan. That I actually rested in silence and the, the plan appeared. And it was only until the plan didn't appear that there was a recognition that I never once came up with a plan. <laughs> and so I sat in nothingness because I knew I could hurt him if I came up with my own plan because he was in pain and I understood the body and, and nerves and being pinched. And, and so I sat for five minutes in silence and um, was just totally perplexed and starting to have some anxiety because this person was paying for a session and in my integrity, <laughs> I wanted to, to serve, you know? And um, so I sat for five minutes and in that emptiness, pictures started appearing on in the inside eye. Um, and I was seeing them in his body and starting to see moments of his childhood arising out of the juncture points in the vertebra where, the, where there was compression of significant experiences that happened with him throughout his life. Um, where trauma had occurred and, and got lodged, uh, were, were held. And so I asked him if I could, if he could have his shiatsu session another time since he paid for it, if he was willing to come back another time and I'd work on him. I explained what I was seeing and asked if he was willing to just go along with this experiment, shared what I was seeing. He was kind of freaked out, the, the detail of what I was seeing that happened. And the whole session started. So I started then having people, it was just word of mouth, coming in for that kind of session, <laughs> which I had no control over. I had no control over. I couldn't make pictures appear. Um, nor could I make shiatsu, you know, plans appear of what sessions needed to happen. And so it was, again, because of integrity that, um, you know, it was like Zen training you know, as opposed to the stick, the whack of the, <laughs> of the Zen master, it was for me the inner like impetus of, of integrity. And so people would come in wanting one of these sessions and I couldn't give them a session. I, I, could, I had no control over it. And so there was this intensification on the inside of surrender. So in the initial phases, there'd be a, 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 a banter back and forth of, okay, you got to be quiet. I know I got to be quiet. I know you're talking to yourself. Shush. This isn't going to happen. Time's passing. It's been a couple minutes. Shut up. Shush. Wait, there's the quiet. Oh, you're too loud, right? Just la 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 right? The mind just doing that. <laughs> oh, I haven't thought about that for a while, but, um, Anyway, so, so, but I'm sharing this stuff because we're human, right? This is what the mind does. It talks to itself, <laughs> right? So, 
And this is after the initial awakening, when I was going around saying an awakening happened. So I'm sharing this also to just help you not beat yourself up for the, the process. We're, we're human. This is that's what our minds do. And, and um, this awakening for me has been um, very gradual, but very deep and very wide. So it's, it's, uh, it's kind of like, you know, big, big movement happening here. Um, but in the beginning, this is what it was. It was just the mind then um, having that exchange. And so, the, again, the will would be used. There'd be a, 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 a surrendering. And finally, the mind would get quiet enough there'd be a resting and stillness. There would be enough space in between thoughts, enough space that then the images would start appearing. And once the images start appearing, then I could focus on that and that movement would kind of keep, keep the unfolding. So it was through that whole process, it was propelled through the healing work of opening deeper in through consciousness and and understanding how consciousness worked right there was consciousness was revealing itself how the thoughts would then move through meridians in the body and emotions would be stored in meridians in the body and how the organ systems functioned and um were an overarching organization and patterning of the minds and the emotions, the minds, the, the thoughts in the mind and, and the emotions and how the whole system was um, one whole communication system, one whole communication system. And my consciousness had to keep surrendering through all these layers and surrend ultimately surrendering then through the soul body and accessing past life material and surrendering into these deeper and deeper layers of, of consciousness and, and seeing karma and DNA and how the whole thing is just one exquisite fabric of consciousness playing itself out, expressing itself, experiencing itself understanding itself so yeah i don't know i mean i i can there's there's a, a i can share more but i'm wondering if perhaps there are any questions about what i've shared so far please don't mm -hmm. do it everybody at the same time because <laughs> <laughs> Anyone? Okay. So you um, said you had three fears um, in the beginning, oh. and I <laughs> I only got one. So I was wondering if you could go over them again. Yeah. Thank you so much for um, yeah just saying that because I don't think I explained why they were true, <laughs> which is really really crucial. Um, because it also explains where they were false. So um, the three fears were that my life would completely change, I would lose total control, and I would be bad. So um, my life completely, totally changed. It totally changed. <laughs> I'm living in Hawaii, <laughs> right? Like, I'm, I'm a, I, I moved, I let go of a in-office practice because my work exponentially exploded open and I'm supporting people in an entirely different way in this miraculous thing. My whole, my, yeah, the everything changed. And so the, the, the human parts of us that that w want to that have an idea about safety 
an actual misunderstanding about safety, um, try to hold and protect and keep the status quo or be with the habitual familiarity. So I, I liked my life as it was. I totally, totally loved my life and my healing practice and uh, my horse and the car I had at the time, my house, you know, my dancing community, my girlfriends, <laughs> right? The whole thing I loved. So I didn't want it to change. Um, but I will say it completely changed and it is exponentially more exciting and satisfying and rich and um, and beautiful. So the second fear was um, losing control, right? It wasn't that I chose to live in Hawaii or I chose to have my healing practice change or I chose to move away <laughs> from the dance community or chose to shift the friendship circle that I had. The larger movement of consciousness changed those things. And, um, but again, even though there was so much that was beautiful and I, I loved, the universe takes care of itself and keeps offering the perfection of, of what's, what's wanted in both love and satisfaction and joy and growth. We just don't necessarily see it at the time or recognize that's what's happening. Um, right, there's a, like a redirection, you know, like the example of these different healers that I studied with all beautiful paths, but what was offered to me was something that would redirect me, saying, uh-uh, that's not it, <laughs> you know? Um, and so sometimes we have difficulties in our life, which is, which is the larger totality of you as all existence, redirecting yourself in this game board of life. And so what one can experience is lack of control as a bad thing or a frightening thing is actually divine, divine movement. It's divine, it's divine orchestration. Um, and then the last one of feeling bad. Um, what happened for me was in this opening through the soul, the soul layer, there are, that was my um, default misinterpretation of the universe. So when we're learning and, and growing, you know, if you're, if you're looking at a, at a, a child who's playing with um, wooden pegs and a, a block and there are square pegs and round pegs and and the, the child is, is playing with them and exploring them, exploring how this block fits in here. You know, and if they're having a, a using a square block and trying to fit it into the, the round hole, they're not bad. They're not wrong. They're not stupid. They're not at fault. <laughs> It's just divine exploration. It's divine exploration. And, um, and so you can see in this, my explanation of the, the innocence of a child, there's nothing wrong with the hand on the block and the hand on the thing it's supposed to go into and the, and the, the, the innocence and the exploration. And so my interpretation of being bad was my repetitive, it was my default misinterpretation. So any of your patterns that keep, the, the, that are, are the patterning that you keep seeing through is just a default misinterpretation. 
And so the truth of that third fear of feeling bad, the truth of it was, it was an energetic um, framing, uh, energetic experience or, or patterning at that point because it had been experienced a zillion, billion, trillion times, <laughs> right? That, that that was going to have to be felt and seen through and surrendered through. So, um, so it showed up as a fear but in the willingness to be with that. And then as I open through all the past lives and starting to see all these lifetimes of like, ooh, I did that. Ooh, <laughs> I did that. <laughs> you know, there was this feeling of being bad. And, and you know, and, and seeing lifetimes on both sides of experience. So of the block being the block that has a round hole and the block that has the, the square, the square peg, I get to experience both sides, the side of the round peg and the side of the square block and the, and, and how, how do, how does the universe work? Well, experience it from this side. Okay. Experience it from this side. All right, now try it from this side. Now evolve more, understand more. Now what do you do, you know? So, and as evolution happens, you know, as you take the kindergartner and get them evolving through the evolutionary school, then if they end up with only the round hole in the square block, then maybe they've figured out how to use some different tools in the shop and they trim down the square block and make it round and <laughs> fit it in. You know, it's like we start to learn how to consciousness is so malleable. And so what used to feel like solid working parts within ourselves start to be changeable and malleable. And, um, Yeah, then maybe the, the, the quantum PhD evolution, you just go into oneness with the round block and the, the square block and the, well, yeah, you go into oneness with it and you make it round, <laughs> right? And they can fit together because consciousness has learned how to play with the molecules of itself to shift and shape and move things together, right? So, so evolution doesn't ever end. And so it may be then the, the fears right in the beginning the way of navigating through the fears was meeting these patterns that felt fixed. And for me, having to meet each one, each lifetime, each moment. So I would meet lifetimes multiple times, being with experiences that happened at different points in that lifetime that still wanted to get resolved. And when I was seeing all this in people's bodies, it started out at first just seeing their current lifetime and then um, the images that I was seeing that contained all that information would then have a, a like a, a gold thread appearing behind the image of this lifetime. And I would see a previous lifetime and see the current lifetime players in their incarnations in the previous lifetime with that same person, you know, different, different, time period, different temperature, different food, different culture, um, and, and have the whole, that whole body of information present itself. So I would see these images, this gold thread would appear with the image of all the past life material related to the current moment. It was presenting itself because the emotional material had a deeper source from a previous moment in time where it was categorized in the soul and also then being held in the meridian system and the organ system. Um, so I would start seeing the deeper, deeper root. And in my own traje trajectory, that that was what wanted to be plumbed, right, to that depth inward. And so there was a shifting uh, or a, a, a tracking of a, a being with the um, a deepening of the revealing 
of what happened in the storylines. And so the emotions felt more solid, right? So with those three fears, the, the last one being of, of feeling badly, it was so significant that that's how I related to it, that it was actually really true. And ultimately it's, it's not true. And, and so in the full meeting of those, there was a willingness, there was a willingness to be bad. And so in that whole deep commitment to truth, where the mind had surrendered, purpose had surrendered, the self had surrendered, it surrendered to, I just want what's true. And if I'm bad, this also makes me just want to cry in this moment. And if I'm bad, then, yeah, it still makes you want to cry. Then, then let me know that truth. Because the truth is more important to me than, than how I feel about it. So that initial setting aside of those three fears was significant. There was a profound trust in that. There was a profound commitment to truth that I was willing to be bad in, in God's eyes, in the universe's eyes. And so when that stuff started to come forward, I understood why that had been a, a fear. And I continued to open through the layers and um, that uh, movement kept pulling me deeper and deeper into the individual consciousness, in through the soul consciousness, the collective consciousness, in through this God self consciousness that is, in my experience, larger than the soul, and then starting to open to God consciousness from which our God selves arise out of, and then our soul arises out of that, and then our lifetimes are then experienced out of that. So, um, yeah, so thank you for that, bringing me back to that, those, those three fears. And the other thing I'll just extrapolate on a little bit too is the, um, that following things through in through the people that I was working with, that I had to surrender myself so there was a surrendering through all aspects of it. And, and every time I needed to um, open through a new layer, I would have to let go of my own consciousness, let go of my own sense of self to open from the personality mind to soul mind, or from the human emotional body to the larger emotional field of consciousness. Um, I, I shared this um, with a, a friend the other day, and I would love to, it's, um, it's a little, it's taking this a little further than what we've been talking about now, uh, but it was a great, it was a great um, way of explaining and I'd love to offer it. So I want to use the hand as the example. Well, people would often ask, you know, or think I was doing something to them. You know, like in the healing, I was healing them. And so I came up with an explanation of why that wasn't actually really what was happening. And this use of the hand explanation is taking it further than how I have shared it before. So if you've heard this before, what I'm going to share is, is there, there's more. So um, the way I spoke about it in the past was if the whole hand, let's say the whole hand is, is, is God or the totality, it's one, it's one thing, you know, one thing. And that each finger is a person, that the person gets to have an individual experience, gets to see themselves as separate from the other finger, right? But they're actually the whole hand. And so in my, in the healing work, <clears throat> consciousness here just opened itself to here. So then it's functioning from the hand. So 
it looks like this finger is doing something to that finger. It may be true that this finger is resonating with the truth of this at a higher awareness or consciousness or a greater amplitude than this finger, but it still recognizes it's all one, it's all one thing. And so it's not that something is being done from here to here. There's the deep truth, the deep truth that's resonating here. It's like then the deep truth starts to wake itself up and resonate here. The, the, what I want to add to this is um, uh, the, the surrendering through I am and the different fabrics of embodiment. So your physical body is one fabric. Your soul is another fabric. They uh, function. They, they, there are differences in the way that they function. Um, they all have an individual expression at the same time are in oneness with the plane or the dimensional frequency or game board or plane of existence that they appear within. So your body looks like it's a separate thing. Looks like it's a separate thing walking around in this plane. Your body is made of air, oxygen, water, minerals. It's made of the stuff of this plane. Your body is not separate in any way. You're breathing oxygen all the time. If you stop, you're not going to do so well, right? You, you, um, so this is just an example of, of how we get to have the illusion of separateness. When the substance, it's, this, it's made of the exact same substance. So if I use this, use my hand, and say this top joint is your personality, your body, your human body. This middle joint is your soul body. This joint here, that or joint, this, this bone is your God self. And the hand is God. So just using this as a, as a way of trying to explain something. So um, for me, surrendering and each of these has their own sense of i am of integrity the i am of the personality has this memory bank of this lifetime right has the sense of itself its integrity on this level the soul has its own sense of self the sense of self that that self includes it's inclusive of all the lifetime experiences it's one i am with all those experiences of the soul so it's a sense of one it's a one i am the same way in you as your personality you have one sense of i am it's just me i'm different than my person sitting next to me this is my container even though that container is actually completely inseparable from the whole field so the soul level functions that way too and the soul has its experience of its container, my soul, my lifetimes, my soul plan with other souls. But it is also one inseparable from the substance that makes that whole plane. That is also true on the God self level. An individuated sense of self that has its purpose, divine exploration unfolding, creative powers, creative capacity, individuated nature, but also as oneness with that whole plane. I have not opened beyond God to say anything about that. <laughs> um, but in the experiences of God, there's a recognition of the God self that's created feels like a child of God. It's a, 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 the creative capacity that God is um, and that that, that um, 
ripples through or manifests through each of these layers of self for with purpose and uh, creation and exploration and experience and evolution and joy. So, and it's, and it's all one I am, right? It's one single I am that then has these vehicles, these contained vehicles that it gets to experience through. So the whole thing is one I, I am. The whole plane is one I am. When you open to that, the, the I am of that whole plane, you are it. And that's where all these cities or um, extra, extra sensory gifts come from because it's all you. And so opening through the oneness of that plane, it, it, it's your body then. And your body functions and has a different skill set and different purpose and, um, I don't know, I want to say illumin illuminatory capacity, <laughs> you know? So it's like then the light of truth, the light of existence, the light that's prior to these dimensional bodies then can move fluidly, fluidly shine thoroughly through the whole system. And so illumination or enlightenment, right, is this deeper truth of being that that's dimensional body frequency is light. So that I am is the same I am as everything else. So for me, there was a fluidity, the, the breaking or the seeing through that lens, that sense of self as Kristen, the seeing through that lens to the I am of all these different aspects is what's happened here where there's a, a fluidity through both the vertical line this way, right? The vertical line of all these layers of oneself to the, the, the totality. And then there's also been a permeability of these um, containers of sense of self through the horizontal, through the manifestation, through the, through the sphere, you know, through the, um, the layers of creation. And that sense of I am, so yeah, maybe more simply, right? The, the I am feels the same. The me, that qualitative feeling of me, I am, it's the same everywhere you go. When you open to any part, it's still, it's the same I am. It still feels like the same truth of the truth in the personality, the truth in the soul, truth in the light body, truth of the whole plane, truth of God. What's different is the quality of the vehicle that's being perceived from. So because it's a different exploration that the universe is doing. So the quality of seeing through your personality and having access to this life feels one particular way in the midst of being one I am. When you open to the soul level and start having access to that memory, it's the same I am. It is still going to feel like, oh my God, it's me. I'm still here. <laughs> you know, I'm still here. It's the same me. But the whole the, the whole vehicle, you're seeing through a different resting point of consciousness, a different vehicle of uh, expression and experience and exploration. The, the, the point, I was checking our time. So the, the reference point, so I wanna address this experience of cessation, of that feeling of annihilation like as one starts to move closer to seeing through a lens, it can sometimes feel like you're going to die or that sense of annihilation or that what I use the word cessation of a, a surrendering of existence. It feels like you're surrendering your existence. What it looks like to me is happening and is consistently so far seems to be true is if we use this hand example again if we say the joint is the cessation point where there's a sense of non-existence and then what's happening is that 
consciousness, the envelope that's been created for your experience in any one of these planes, that envelope is supposed to have integrity. It is supposed to form itself for one single consciousness to have multiple experiences. So you have to have a container to be able to tell yourself, to tell your, the difference between you and someone else. And I call that that sense of self envelope. And that, it's supposed to be there. That's how this whole brilliant thing is being orchestrated. And it's happening with the, the plant, right? The plant outside knows itself as itself, which is how it can then keep the bugs out of it. Or if it's in out of balance, it'll draw the bugs because that's the, the play that's happening. Same thing for you in getting a cold or an infection. That there's a divine, there's a divine play that's happening. This is another whole topic. This will be another, another call we'll do maybe at some point, but around um, that integrity and health and imbalance and um, the perfection of imbalance in terms of the movement forward of creation and evolution and karma and all of that. Um, but in terms of this, this envelope, um, the reason I brought that up is just saying like, that's how everything functions. The wood on the wall here knows itself as wood, right? Where there's the consciousness is playing this game everywhere. And that in your inner pathway of awakening, the sense of I am is supposed to have this vehicle and, and have that sense of integrity. And as human beings, we can experience that sense of integrity as a safety mechanism for physical survival. It's part of the instincts that have happened due to the collapsing nature of the contraction that has been happening and the fear-based lifetimes that we've had and the fear-based kind of cultures and experience in the universe that we've been creating and co-creating, um, which has its own perfection in it. So, and so when you meet this envelope of the sense of self, it's hard to like pierce through that. It's hard, right? I get it. And, and it's what we're all sort of like up against is like, wait a minute, it's just one me, but how do you surrender through this thing? So, um, but in terms of a map, um, each of these joints, right, is a, one of those cessa cessation points where the I am of this envelope surrenders, surrenders its perspective. It surrenders the mind that it's seeing through. It surrenders the, in, the emotions it's feeling through. It surrenders its capacity to track itself. It surrenders its will. All of that gets surrendered. So it's a, it's a significant surrendering to that cessation and then opens up. Opens up because it's one I am that's seamless through the whole thing, creating these lenses. So all that you're doing is, is shifting from one aperture, but like a camera, if the focus is smaller in here, and then you're just opening to a larger aperture. But often it can have that sense of dying or death. So that feeling of dying, I would just encourage to not be afraid of. To not be afraid of that. It's just part of the experience. And... You fortunately had a ton of experience because you've died in human bodies a zillion times. So you already know how to die. <laughs> and part of what happens is that those, met, those feelings can get tripped up. And it's like, oh my God, I'm going to die. Yes, you're going to die. We're all going to die. This gorgeous body you are in now is going to die. This body is going to die. And, and it's just... Uh, um, an embracing of, of the brilliance of the design. 
I'm being given a bunch of information here um, that I think is for another time. Uh, great things coming up and I'm just completely on fire, <laughs> you know, in terms of sharing, sharing all this stuff. It's like becoming much more um, uh, grounded and embodied in me, which means in terms of this thing, like the vessel, this vessel is amplifying the truth of the all of us, the whole, at a, a stronger, more powerful kind of frequency. So there's there's a more powerful transmission. Um, not that they weren't strong before for people, but I, I'm aware of this, like, this system's like ready to just like kind of on fire and ready to share. So, okay. Yeah. Well, um, we'll have the chance to give you a hug when you come everybody. <laughs> so I guess everybody's going to say goodbye. Thank, Bye. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so looking forward to seeing you very soon. Yeah. Yeah. Take care. Mwah, mwah, mwah.